the first video, we created the mesh for these parts. And in the second video, we set up the simulation with all its necessary keywords using LS Prepost. And in this third video, we will begin by uh, doing a model check. And then we will move on to actually submit the job using LS Run. Here is the model that we created over the course of the past two videos, and which is ready to be submitted. Or, before we do that, we ought to perform a model check to see if there are any obvious errors which would result in the simulation crashing. To do so, you can use the model checker which is found in the top menu under Application. You can also reach the model checker in another way, and that is from the Keyword Manager. Here, there is a button called Model Check, which gets you to the same place. Let's perform a keyword check to see that the keyword syntax is down. Now, you see that there is one error and one warning in the model. Errors are fatal and will result in a failed simulation, while warnings are not as severe and are more of an indication that something in the setup isn't optimal, so to speak. If I open up the part section here and double click the error, you see that it is caused by part number three not having any material definition. And if you go back to the previous video and rewatch the part where we defined our materials, you'll see that I neglected to assign a material to the square end plate in order to trigger this error message. And this is something that must be fixed before the model can be run. So to do so, let's go to our Keyword Manager, open up the part keywords. And as you can see, this, this is the box causing the error, since this is empty here. So let's now return to the model checker to see what the warning message is about. And as you see that when I rechecked it, the error message went away. The warning message is under one of the database keywords. And if I open this up, we see that there is something wrong with the cross-section plane keyword. So if we double click that to see an explanation, it then tells us that the database cross-section plane that we have defined has length values that are less than or equal to zero. Let's go to the keyword in question to see what this means. The warning message was triggered by these two keyword options having values of zero. Now, you can check the LSDINA keyword manual to know the syntax of each keyword, but for many keyword options, inputting a value of zero results in a default value being used. And as you can see from the explanatory text down here, that in this case, that means that the two sides of the cross-section plane are infinitely long. In our model, this is not really a problem, but Say that we would have had a part to the side here, or perhaps a second part on top here. Then the cross-section plane would collect data from those parts as well. Since its sides are infinitely long, the cross-section plane would cut through those as well. So as you can see, warnings are not as critical as errors but they are instead often an indication that something could potentially become a problem. If we go back and take a last look at the keyword checker, you'll see that there is also a message about something here being unreferenced. And if we take a closer look, we see that it is the second curve I created when I demonstrated the curve generation tool. Having unreferenced items in your model doesn't have to be a problem. It won't disturb the simulation in any way, but it could be an indication that you have missed to use something. Moving over to the contact checker, here you can see if there are initial penetrations in your contact definitions, which you might want to fix before running your model since they can cause problems. Let us begin with the contact between the square tube and the flat plate. So that would be contact number two. If we press this button here, check for initial penetrations. 
And as you can see by the message displayed down here, there are no initial penetrations for this contact. Next, checking the self contact for the square tube. We once again see that there are no initial penetrations. Lastly, we should also make sure that the tied contact works as it should. So we move over to check tied contacts instead. I just move these a bit out of the way so we can see what's going on. So you remember the tied contact is between the square end plate and the square tube. And I can toggle on to uh, show the tied nodes. And they are now lit up. And as you can see, it does behave in the way we want it to. We have now made sure that the model is sound. We can be confident that the simulation should run smoothly. Before any simulation can be run, we first have to save the keyword file. And when you do so, make sure that the keyword files for each simulation have their own folder, since if you run two simulations in the same folder, it will cause results to be overwritten. I'm going to save this in an appropriate folder here. Like so. Let us proceed by moving over to LS Run. This is what LS Run looks like. And the first thing you do is to provide the input file here at the top. Then we must decide what variant of Venestina we want to use. And by variant, I mean these options at the preset box. First off, single or double refers to numerical precision, which basically means how many decimals will be kept when Elestina deals with a number. Single precision allows a floating point number, four bytes of memory whereas double precision allows it eight bytes of memory, meaning that with double precision, a floating point number will have roughly twice as many significant digits compared to single precision. For implicit analyses in Elestina, you have no option but to use double precision since the solver demands higher numeric accuracy in order to function, and there is a built-in failsafe where if you try and run an implicit analysis using single precision, Elestina won't start the analysis and will instead tell you to switch to double precision. For explicit analyses, such as the one in this tutorial, on the other hand, you must decide if you need the increased accuracy from using double precision or if single precision is good enough. When making that decision, one should bear in mind that using double precision comes at the price of approximately 30% higher computational cost. The next thing to decide is whether to use the SMP variant or the MPP variant of Elestina. A simplified explanation is that with SMP, you are limited to performing all computations on a single computer where all computations share the same RAM memory. If you use the MPP version, on the other hand, it is possible to split up your model into several submodels, which allows you to run your simulation on several computers and having them communicate results in between themselves. I won't get into the more technical details, but I would recommend that you use the MPP version since parallelization then scales better for larger models than if you use the SMP version. And a second reason why you might want to use the MPP version is because that's what most simulations are run with, so the functionality might sometimes be further developed and tested. I doubt that we would see any difference in the case of our relatively small model, but I'm going to use the MPP variant with single precision. We then have to provide the file path for the matching solver, as you can see up here. I click the Browse icon. Since we have MPP with single precision, we should then go with this one here. As you can see, 
I'm going to use the R13.0 version of Elastina. And I would recommend that you always try to use the latest version since new functionality and bug fixes are continuously added to the program. The only thing that's left to do before we can submit the job is to specify the number of CPUs, as well as this memory flag. By running the simulation on multiple CPUs, also referred to as cores, we utilize the concept of parallel computing to speed things up. Ideally, you want your simulation time cut in half by doubling the number of cores, but in reality, you're often faced with a diminishing returns behavior, where the more cores you provide, the less simulation time each additional core saves you. To achieve the ideal scaling with parallelization, you can take as a rule of thumb that for every CPU, there should be 10,000 elements in your model. For the memory flag, you specify a number of so-called words where one floating point number in the simulation is a word. And as I mentioned previously, a floating point number consists of either four or eight bytes, depending on if you use single or double precision, respectively. The suffix m refers to millions, meaning that by setting the flag to 20m, the simulation is allowed 20 million words of memory. With everything clear, let us now submit the job, which we do by pressing this button on the left. And you see that the simulation starts running, which marks a good ending for this video.